Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so I'm not originally a mathematician, but I'm interested in mathematics and actually the formalization of mathematics in particular in type theory. And I'm going to show you, uh, present you uh, something that is a linguist uh, linguistic feature for formalizing mathematics in a proof assistant based on type theory, so COC in our case. Uh, and I would, I mean, I will do a demonstration mostly because I cannot go really into the details of the um, of the technique, but just to give you a hint of our, uh, uh, a taste of what Coq is like and what my uh, uh, my work is about. Okay, so type classes, a uh, linguistical feature to uh, to have all add overloading in a language, so to enhance type inference on in our language using overloading. So in in programming terms, this helps doing a generic programming, so programming with interfaces instead of data structures directly. So think about uh, uh, having a, a data type and some operations and working with these operations, but not looking at the actual implementation. There could be, for example, many implementations of a set uh, on a computer using lists, using trees, and so on. We don't want necessarily to go into uh, and to look at the actual implementation, but work on the, on the abstract structure, like we do in mathematics. So that's a tool that will help, uh, help us do that. And also, in, uh, in the case of, uh, of a proof assistant, we want to have generosity as much as possible to reuse proofs as well as, as our programs. So we will, uh, I mean, this mechanism will enable us to name, for example, all the reflexivity proofs in our system using the name reflexivity and not give a single uh, a, a name to each of these proofs which you might find in your system. You might have tons of proof of reflexivity for any, I mean, all the relations that you use. You just want to refer to it by reflexivity. Like you do in mathematics, you have the, this context of, uh, of object structures uh, that, that is implicit when you write uh, mathematics. And it is accessible, actually, uh, also on a computer. OK. So I'm going to do a little demo and present you some co code. OK, so I don't know. Who, who is not familiar with Coq here? OK. So I will start with really the basics. Uh, Coq allows you to write definitions, so constant definitions, like you would do in mathematics. So I name this definition foo. It has type nat, a natural number, and the content of this definition is just the number one. Okay. We have inductive types, uh, which um, how do you say? Uh, have basically enumerations for for our purpose here, but actually uh, represent uh, well-founded trees. So you could. Uh, uh, describe any data structure that you could describe using a, a tree, a tree structure. So here I define the booleans, which have, which are a set. There's just two elements in this set, the true constructor and the false constructor, and you can discriminate on booleans to say to see if a boolean is true or false. And we have uh, computation principles associated to that definition, and also an induction principle. So here at the bottom you can see the type of the eliminator which says for any property on Booleans. Actually, it goes going to type, but it could be just a proposition here. If you can uh, prove that, uh, uh, that I mean, if you can give a proof for P of true and P of false, then you can give a proof for all Booleans that P is true. Oops. Okay. And this is actually not an axiom. It's implemented in the, in the system using a case construct. So to do to actually do that proof, you will. Uh, can you see my cursor? You will actually discriminate on the on the boolean, and in each branch, in the true branch, we'll return the proof that uh, that p is true, f here, and in the false branch, we'll return the proof that p is false. Okay. So this is all uh, defined in our theory. So we just start with this uh, inductive uh, definition principle, and we build all our data types from this. Okay. Now let's see how we would uh, formalize uh, uh, mathematical data structures in our system. So this is just a notation. We don't have to care about this right now. So these inductive types also encompass, uh, uh, I mean, include uh, records. So you can build a record of, uh, on uh, on any types. So a record is just a tuple, name tuple. So you have name for each of the fields. Here I define a semigroup, which has a carrier, which is a set of its elements. 
an operation, a binary operation, takes two arguments and returns something in the carrier. And I have a proof also that this, uh, this operation is associated. Okay, so here I use this notation, the dot, for the product of our summing group. So here I define that this, uh, when, when Cox sees this syntax, it will pass it as uh, the application of the summing group operation. Okay, so as you can see, we both have types in our records, operations, proofs, they're all, they're all living in the same universe. Okay. No, you cannot see. So actually, a summing group uh, structure is just an inductive uh, type with just one constructor and uh, as many arguments as there are fields in, a, in our record. So again, to define the projections from the record, we just do pattern matching and we take out the first uh, component of the tuple, the second, and so on. All right. Any questions? Don't hesitate. Let's go further and define a, a semigroup morphism. So we take it's a record with some parameters, G and G prime, which are two semigroups. It contains a function from G to G prime, from the carrier of G to the carrier of G prime, and a proof that it respects uh, the product operation. Okay. Again, another record defined in just the same way. And now let's do a proof about this. Let's, let's show that we have a summing group morphism from G to G, so the identity morphism. So that proof will be an element of the inductive type of semigroups. groups So it will contain a function and a proof that this uh, function respects uh, the product. Okay, so here, using refine, I give part of the proof that uh, I have a summing group morphism. So I give the identity function. From x, I give x. Okay, and then I'm, I get back a, a goal, which you can see on the, on the right, that for all x, y, if I have x dot y, it is, it is equal to x dot y. So this, that's a simple proof by uh, reflexivity of the equality. Okay. Mm, we can also build uh, the composite of two semigroup morphisms. And again, prove that it's... Uh, that it respects uh, the products. But actually, this proof is a, a bit more, more involved. So we have more groups uh, involved here. We have three groups. And when we want to uh, actually give the function here that will go from G to G second, we have to first take the, the function from the G to G prime morphism, then apply uh, the function from the G prime to G second morphism, and apply this uh, to X, to our initial element. Um, okay, so here I give underscores because this, this functions, smg morph fn, uh, if I show you the, its type, oops, sorry, oops, can you see it, oops, sorry, I'm kind of pasting. Okay, so this projection function takes two semigroups, a semigroup morphism, and gives you the, the, internal, the function that's internal to this semi group morphism. So from the carrier of G to the carrier of G prime. So when we want to apply it, uh, we first have to give the two semi groups and the semi group morphism, right? We have to uh, refer to the, the big structure to get back uh, to the projection, the projecting function. So here I give underscores to, uh, to not actually give this argument to Koch, so that, I mean, with the expecting that it will infer what this, uh, this argument will be, depending on the context, the types of the objects that are applied, or the type of the goal that we have. So we have the summing group morphism from G to G seven here. But Koch will not be able to, uh, to infer this by itself. It requires a bit of proof search to actually do that, to realize that in our context, we actually have a uh, morphism from G to G prime and another one from G prime to G second. We need to do a bit of proof search in the context just to find those. Okay. So that's what type classes are about. It's this ability uh, during type checking when we enter terms in Coq 
to do a bit of proof search that a mathematician does implicitly in his head when he's writing statements or proofs. Okay, so I redefine here the semigroup morphism as a class instead of a record. So that's the important keyword here. It has exactly the same definition, exactly the same implementation, except for a little trick. So we can define as before uh, our identity morphism. It's the same, exactly the same record that we have underneath. But what will be the situation when we want to do uh, the composition? Now we know that this, uh, the projection function here, is overloaded for any g, g prime, and morphism between them. So we can just apply these two functions, not giving the actual semigroup morphism structure. And from the types of uh, x and our goal, it will actually infer that it needs to find a uh, semigroup morphism from g to g prime and another one from g, g prime to j second, and we'll find them in the context uh, hypothesis. So it will just use these variables to, uh, to fill the gaps, fill the holes that we had before. Okay. So now if I print everything, I maybe you didn't see before. So it looks a bit obfuscated, that's, that's OK. So actually, these were the holes before. By uh, type unification, we could find that g prime and uh, g second were needed, he needed here, and same for g prime, g second here. But the actual structure could not be found. There might be actually many morphisms from g prime to g second. So you have to, um, to set a convention on which way you will resolve uh, these instances, so which way you will find the structures from the context. So that's something that mathematicians do too, I think. Okay. So we have a complete term here, and we can look at the proof that you have, uh, I mean, at what we have to prove now. So we have this, this goal. Uh, actually, the, the way to prove this is just to rewrite uh, using the uh, the proof that uh, SMG morphon uh, respects the product in both uh, in both semigroups, and actually this proof is overloaded. So the fact that uh, this, this function respects uh, the product in G and the fact that it respects in G prime, you can name in the same way using just the, the canonical SMG morph res proof. So we rewrite twice using respect of the semigroup morphism. And this, uh, again, is finished by reflexivity. Okay. <coughs> so how does this instance resolution work, actually? So here I, I got uh, out of this section. We have no instance uh, declared for the semigroup morphisms, but we can add instances. So instances or class instances are uh, objects which have type semigroup morphism for some semigroups maybe with some hypothesis. So we can declare that our identity morphism and the compose uh, lemma both make uh, semigroup morphisms. And now they are part of our instance database. So the things we have in our context that we can use to uh, fill, the, fill the holes. So if I want to uh, infer here an object of type semigroup morphism from S to S, the machine will be able to just infer that you want the identity morphism here. So we can use this uh, inference principle for many things in, in Coq. In particular, we will uh, use it a lot for uh, common proofs, for, for example, proof of uh, associativity of your of operations. So we can declare a class of associative uh, uh, objects or functions. So it has two parameters, a type and a function, and just a proof that it is associative. We can give uh, an instance of this class for any semigroup. We know that uh, its operation is associative. Okay. And now we can prove using this uh, generic name that uh, associative in this uh, particular semigroup G is, uh, uh, yeah, that this statement holds in this uh, semigroup just using associativity. But of course, you could define associative for 
plus malt, I mean, any, any operation that you have. And always use only this name and not have to devise a complicated convention to, to name things. OK. Do I have time? Or? Uh, yes, I think so. Yeah, but I need I needed uh, the product to I mean for that that statement. Okay. So but uh, yeah, I could I could use f yeah any associative operation has this property yeah. Okay. So we can actually uh, continue in the same way and go a, a bit further and use type classes even for the the properties of the summing group. And even for the operation of the semigroup, which might be overloaded, you might have many interpretations for a dot. So here we define a new class for semigroup operation, which has just the content of the operation itself, no proofs, no properties. And we have a generic notation, the dot, for the semigroup operations. Now we say that a semigroup on some type has just this, this overloaded operation and a proof that it is associative. So each time we have a semigroup in our context, we can also find instances. So this uh, little colon bracket here says that we can also find a semigroup operation on the carrier, and that this semigroup operation is associative. So it's part of the inference too. Okay. And we can define traditional instances of semigroups using this uh, technique too. So I define it for nat and plus here natural numbers and uh, addition. And yes, let me get more easily. But I should stop here, I think. That's more, but it's more syntactic stuff. I like to wrap up. OK. Um, here. OK, so I've showed you how our classes are implemented, just as traditional uh, records the same fields. The instances are just definitions of, uh, of type this record. <coughs> then the, the only trick that we use is to define special implicit arguments that will put our holes in the, in the terms, and a proof search uh, engine that will fill the holes for us. So on this little example, we want to uh, apply the EQB overloaded uh, function to two Booleans. So if we expand this implicit argument, which is just a syntactic device, we get this uh, second term with two holes for A and the equality. By unification of typing, we know that we have Booleans, so we want an equality on Booleans. And the proof search will return us a record for the equality on Booleans. And we have a complete term that we can uh, give to the type checker. Uh, OK, I'm going to skip that example. So of course, there's um, still many issues to be um, resolved with this uh, uh, this feature, <coughs> mainly of proof search and, and control issues. So in simple cases where you just index by a type, you will want something for nat for the natural numbers for the rationals or reals and so on. That's pretty simple. But if you have more structure in your index, then proof proof search becomes complicated, and you have I mean you might want to control it, and it's. Currently in deterministic, so there's ways to make this more deterministic or to actually uh, set a convention, let the um, user say, this is how I want to resolve these uh, unknowns. So there are, there are lots of work in the, in the logic program community to actually solve this kind of problems. Uh, there's no, so it's more uh, technical questions of the efficiency and uh, how, how to set up the, re the search. We're cur currently doing only backward search, where we could do forward search. So when you have something in context, you can derive a lot of things from it. Currently, we only go the other way around, from the goal to uh, the hypothesis. Mm. There's a risk of non-termination. So it means that uh, pre-typing a term. So if you don't give a complete cock term, it might be that the proof search will uh, last forever. <coughs> so we want to control that and analyze uh, the search problem to see if it will terminate or not. So this is decidable in some cases when we have more information on the constant use. 
And there's also many implementation techniques we could use to uh, make this more efficient. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.